We're at the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom and today we are joined by an alcohol and addiction specialist by the name of Professor David Berlin and uh, Professor Berlin is a, prof a professor of behavioral neuroscience and is a specialist in impulsive compulsive disorders such as alcohol and drug addiction, stress and anxiety. Professor, I always giggle to myself a little bit when I hear it's drug and alcohol addiction because isn't alcohol actually a drug? Alcohol is a drug and interestingly enough, uh, the brain doesn't really care uh, about the legal status of drugs. So if you smoke nicotine or if you take alcohol, if you take cocaine, all of these drugs will have a very similar effect on a particular system in the brain called the dopamine system. They all share the property of hijacking the system and artificially increasing the levels of dopamine. So the brain does not know that alcohol is a legal drug in many societies. It only understands that it, it alcohol interferes with its biochemical systems. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to be asking you some questions today about the term alcoholic and alcoholism and it's my understanding that those terms don't exist today i mean i know that they've existed over many years and decades of course we have alcoholics anonymous but we were speaking before we hit record here and you were sharing that in actual fact an alcoholic or an alcoholism or alcoholism rather is no longer used in clinical medicine. Is that correct? You just yeah, explain that? It's no longer used in clinical medicine. It's no longer used in research either. Um, we now refer to someone with a substance use disorder or someone with an alcohol use disorder. The reason being that there is still a lot of stigma around these psychiatric conditions. These are psychiatric conditions. And qualifying someone as an alcoholic puts a lot of in, um, impetus on the fact that this individual is its diagnosis, whereas someone with a alcohol use disorder is someone with a particular brain disorder. And that is intended to remediate or at least decrease this profound stigma that still exists around these disorders. So does that mean there are millions of people walking around mistakenly self-identifying as an alcoholic? Well, they, they identify as someone with a, an alcohol use disorder, which 10 years ago, six years ago, was referred to as alcoholism. So the disease has not changed, the disorder has not changed. The, the brain mechanisms of alcohol use disorder are the same as those of what we would refer to as alcoholism. It is the way we refer to the condition that has changed. Yeah. I noticed that you corrected yourself there. You initially referred to it as a disease and then you changed just what you said to a disorder. Why, Why is that? Because um, the notion of a disease is um, always controversial when one discusses psychiatric conditions because the issue with psychiatric conditions as of today is that we still lack understanding of these conditions, or at least the biological foundations of these conditions, to be able to make a measurement of the individual and say this is a diagnosis. The diagnosis which is offered or given by a psychiatrist defines the condition. So if I have a diagnosis of having alcohol use disorder, I have alcohol use disorder in the absence of any biological marker of me having that disorder. You can't give a diagnosis of cancer in the absence of any biological marker. So these are disorders because as of today, in 2024, we still understand at the end very little about the biological basis of these disorders and they represent a constellation of alterations in a large variety of systems in the brain that makes them disorders more than a particular disease. So let's start by defining what is an alcohol use disorder and what is not an alcohol use disorder. Oh, uh, an alcohol use disorder is an interaction with alcohol that results in the individual suffering from it or the relative or friends or siblings of that individual suffering from use. So um, in the current um, clinical practice, there would be 10 criteria that would define alcohol use disorder. Uh, one individual would have to meet 
at least two of these 10 criteria over a period of 12 months to be deemed having an alcohol use disorder. And then there can be different severities attached to this diagnosis with mild, moderate, and severe. So someone with two criteria would have a mild alcohol use disorder. From, um, let me tell you, from four to five symptoms, they would have a moderate alcohol use disorder, and any, anywhere between six and more symptoms, it would be a severe alcohol use disorder. So give me two examples of what's on that 10 yeah. list criteria, because I would submit that most drinkers, most, let's call them socially acceptable drinkers in the world, probably have a mild form of an alcohol use disorder. At least that would be my sub submission. But re read out a few. And yeah. by the way, these 10 criteria is from the American Psychiatry Association, is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So read out, actually, don't just read out two, read out like all 10. Yeah. So, so we can identify. So the kind of questionnaire you would have is um, um, the, the, the patient uh, at times when you end up drinking more or longer than you intended more than once wanted to cut down or stop drinking or tried but couldn't, spent a lot of time drinking or being sick or getting over other after effects, wanted a drink so badly you couldn't think of anything else. You found that drinking or being sick from drinking offer, often interfered with taking care of your home or family or caused job troubles or school problems continued to drink even though it was causing trouble with your family or friends, given up or cut back on activities that were important or interesting to you or gave you pleasure in order to drink, more than once gotten into situations while or after drinking that increased your chances of getting hurt, such as driving, swimming, using machinery, walking in a dangerous area or having unsafe sex continued to drink even though it was making you feel depressed or anxious or adding to another health problem or after having had a memory blackout, had to drink much more than you once did to get the effect you want or found that your usual number of drinks had much less effect than before, found that when the effects of alcohol were wearing off, you had withdrawal symptoms such as trouble sleeping, shakiness, restlessness, nausea, sweating, a racing heart or a seizure. So these are the various criteria. And if I may, I would argue that it, I don't think it is the case that most of the social drinkers would have a diagnosis of mild AUD. Maybe you haven't hung out with a lot of my friends from <laughs> high school back in the day, Professor, because, I mean, and also because of the line of work that I choose, I am surrounded by people who are trying to have a better relationship with alcohol. And so... I hear these 10 criteria going on all the time. Um, but it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because drinking to a blackout or drinking and then you regret things afterwards or drinking that it affects other people. I don't know. I mean, my, I mean I'm hypothesizing, of course, but I would have thought most drinkers in today's society would be at least two of those people on that 10 list criteria. It may well be the case that they've done it once and they regret and they don't again. The issue with alcohol use disorder is that it's recurrent. recurrent so they okay. keep doing it. And and this is where there's a big difference between going beyond what you should have drunk and doing it repeatedly and losing control over your behavior so that it persists despite your awareness that you shouldn't do it, that it's bad for you. You continue doing it. And that's that's the compulsive nature of alcohol use disorder. You just can't not do it. Yeah. Let's dig into the science now. What is actually happening to the brain when we consume alcohol? What happens to the body? Like, What are the effects of drinking what I refer to as attractively packaged poison? Well, many effects. I, we, we will not have time and opportunity to discuss them all. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, the fact that alcohol, like any other drugs, may they be legal or illegal, is going to result in a profound increase in the release of a neurochemical in the brain called dopamine. Dopamine is often mistaken for the pleasure hormone. It's not that at all. It's a neurotransmitter that is associated with pleasure, but also associated with pain. It helps the brain learn about circumstances in which we experience pleasure. 
or we experience pain so that we can seek out the circumstances in which we experience pleasure and we can avoid those in which we experience pain. So it is a profound teaching signal in the brain all about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. By, its, by itself, it does not mediate pleasure or pain. That is more the job of what is called the endogenous opiate system, which is the system that is directly targeted by drugs such as heroin. Interestingly enough, alcohol has the dirtiest effects of all drugs. It can interfere with that same system that I've just referred to, the endogenous opiate system, indirectly. It will have an effect on the on system in the brain called the glutamatergic system. It will have an effect on the stop system in the brain called the GABAergic system. Many people experience this calming, relaxing, anxiolytic properties of alcohol. These are the properties of alcohol that are mediated by this stop system. Alcohol can trigger dissociations, alterations in memory. That would be its effect on the on system in the brain. And then there's the motivational effect of alcohol, which will be related to its effect on the dopamine system. So other drugs such as cocaine or heroin or nicotine, they have one target in the brain. Alcohol had as many. And we still don't quite understand how its various effects on these different systems add up to produce, in some individuals and not others, a state that will eventually lead to the loss of control over use that is going to give rise to an alcohol use disorder. We still don't quite understand how that works. So if alcohol is having three, four, five times more negative consequences than heroin or cocaine, as if I'm understanding you correctly, is it fair to say that alcohol is the dirtiest, nastiest drug there is? So I would not say it has more negative effects. I would say it has a more complex interaction with the brain and the body than other drugs. Um, it is indeed a very nasty drug. Uh, alcohol results in dehydration. It does interfere with metabolism in your liver, uh, which in the long run can lead to cirrhosis and liver disease. Alcohol is, is indeed a very dangerous drug, yes. Yet society glorifies this very dangerous drug. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not here to make um, to support any use of any drug of any kind. But interestingly enough, uh, as far as we can go back in history, there has not been ever a human society without any drug. <laughs> so for as long as there's been agriculture, more than 100 people, there's been art and there's been drugs. There's been religion and there's been drugs. Alcohol has been there almost from the very beginning. I'm not saying that justifies the use of it, but it may well be the case that at the level of a highly social species as we are, alcohol may well have been used to cope with the pressure of social interactions. There are some theories of evolution that suggest that we are as intelligent as we are because of our reliance as a species on social interactions. And it is very difficult to understand appeals, intentions, and communication is one of the most difficult community functions there are. May, it may well be the case that drugs have been used at some point to kind of smoothen out individual interactions when we interact with multiple individuals. I'm not <laughs> at all suggesting that we should drink alcohol, but there's no evidence of any society ever that, ne that didn't use drugs. Mm. As a behavioral neuroscientist and someone who's studied impulsive and compulsive disorders, and I would surmise someone who watches television or films or movies or, you know, you, you participate in society. And so you see this glorification of alcohol that I'm referring to. We see uh, beer companies sponsoring sporting teams. We see Heineken advertising the Champions League soccer championships. And, you know, it's everywhere. Do you have your own personal view on whether alcohol is fundamentally bad or it can be fundamentally okay. I understand that we're having this conversation through the lens of you're a neuroscientist, but do you have your own personal views on alcohol and its use? Yes, um, but I would have some reserves as to sharing them, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's the exact same thing as 
is sugar bad? Or is junk food bad? Yes, of course, sugar and junk food are not healthy. Do I have a Big Mac from time to time? Yes, I do. Do I like sugar? Yes, I do. But that's, that's me. Um, life kills. Anything that can have a potential risk when we interact with it is potentially dangerous. The problem with drugs, as it is the case with junk food, is that we still cannot predict how dangerous the interaction with the substance is for a particular individual. So, from one culture to another, I'm French, I can't really hide my accent, I, I love wine, but since I started drinking alcohol, I would have rather saved money, I would have bought a nice bottle of wine, and I would have had that as a sensory experience with friends. I've never had alcohol, for instance, to get drunk. That never was the purpose. I don't mean to be patronizing. I'm referring to my own personal history. Um, alcohol is part of my sensory experiences when I have nice cheese or nice bread. And I've never been looking for the effects of it. It's the taste that matters to me. For someone else, you know, alcohol is something that they don't like, as simple as that. And others, they don't like the taste, but they like the effects. And depending on the reasons why you drink and the way your brain is made up, we are all very different, much more different in there than we are in here. Um, one cannot predict today whether you may well be vulnerable to losing control over that behavior. And that is about alcohol, it's about gambling, it's about junk food, it's about use of any drugs or any stimulus that arouses you. And because we are not able yet to tell someone if you engage in this particular behavior, you may develop a debilitating, profoundly hurtful and difficult condition, I would say, yes, it's unsafe, simply because I cannot help individuals know whether it is safe for them or not. Mm. In your research, is it obvious why some people are more prone to an alcohol use disorder compared with others? So it is not quite obvious yet. We're getting there, hopefully. Um, interestingly enough, the field of um, research on drug addiction for, for the first 70 years um, was focusing on trying to understand how the brain responds to drugs. And, uh, and we, I, I could tell you a lot about that. But interestingly enough, you know, if I drink alcohol right now, that will change my brain. But it will tell you nothing about how alcohol changes the brain of someone who will develop an alcohol use disorder, because I have not developed an alcohol use disorder. And it's only been since the early 21st century, 2004 and so forth, that the notion of individual vulnerability to developing substance use disorders and alcohol use disorder has really um, emerged. And we are in the infancy of understanding the notion of individual trajectories in the development of these disorders. I initially, very naively, started my career working on these notions, what makes individuals vulnerable to developing substance use disorders and alcohol use disorder, thinking this vulnerability was wired in the brain of the individual. So if I could observe individuals before they develop the disorder, and once they've developed the disorder, and I can compare them to individuals who would not develop the disorder, having been exposed to alcohol the same way or to cooking the same way, I could, in a you know, subtraction, identify what's different in between these individuals. Except um, my world went completely upside down during COVID. And my, my theoretical understanding of the vulnerability to developing alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder has profoundly changed then. So it's, you would tell me it's only four years ago, but yes. Uh, because I then realized that actually many people who would not have experienced the consequences of the pandemic, such as social isolation and anxiety around potentially using your job and all the lockdowns, 
may well have never developed an alcohol use disorder. What we observed during COVID was a surge in admissions at a &E for alcohol-related problems and a surge in the diagnosis of alcohol use disorders accompanied with a surge in the in relapse to alcohol use disorder in individuals who had maintained abstinence for a pretty long period of time. Why? Why would that happen? Well, the country in which I live, uh, there is a culture around having a beer in the pub and enjoying time with your mates, as you would say. And, um, and it is also a society where it's not necessarily valued to share your emotions or to show your emotions. To some extent, alcohol is there as a social tool to facilitate human interactions late in the evening when you can let the steam off a little bit and you do that with your friends in a particular environment. And some individuals may well have done that for 25 years and they stick to using alcohol in this context and alcohol has not permeated other aspects of their life, so they do not have an alcohol use disorder. And all of a sudden, these individuals start drinking at home, not to spend time with their friends, not to share their emotions, but to medicate mm. anxiety, to medicate a loss of social interactions, a loss of cognitive interactions. And all of a sudden, the same alcohol now interferes with a part of the brain that lights up when you're anxious lights up when you feel bad. And this part of the brain was not online when these individuals were having a beer with their friends at the pub. And all of a sudden you realize that the, the vulnerability is not set in stone. It is dynamic. It depends on the psychoaffective state of the individual when they take the drug. Why is it I take alcohol now? It may well be far more important than how much alcohol I drink now with regards to whether I'm going to develop an alcohol use disorder afterwards. So is another way of saying that there is a difference between a sad drinker, as in a drinker who's feeling sad or isolated, such as in COVID lockdowns, and a happy drinker, which is someone who isn't isolated, seemingly doesn't have many pressures going on in their life and is drinking just for the pure pleasure of life. Yeah, there is. Um, I'm not saying that it's safe to drink alcohol if you are enjoying your time with your friends. That's not what I'm saying. But research clearly demonstrates that alcohol does very poorly alongside stress. So if you are stressed and you drink alcohol, stress is going to exacerbate some of the effects of alcohol and stress opens the gate for alcohol to interfere with parts of the brain that are not accessible to alcohol when you're not stressed. So alcohol has a more pervasive and profound effect on the brain if you drink when you're sad than if you drink when you're not sad. Uh, it happens as well that the more you drink, the more when you do not have alcohol, you'll be sad because chronic exposure to alcohol, as for all drugs, recruits the stress system in the brain. So some people can make themselves sad by using too much alcohol and then they'll be using alcohol to try to medicate the fact that they are sad and this is a vicious cycle from which it is very difficult to escape yet in popular culture on television uh, in movies we always see the stressed person at the end of the day pour themselves a drink as if the drink is somehow relieving them of that stress but in actual fact from a psychological point of view from your research that behavior of drinking to relieve stress and anxiety is simply prolonging stress and anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. It may well have a very acute effect that would be welcomed by the user at the time they take alcohol. But first of all, that opens the door to the development of alcohol disorder in the long run. And that promotes more stress afterwards. So, and it's not just in advertisements, you know, very popular singers right now in their movie clips, um, in their songs, there's, there's a lot of, I'm drinking alcohol when I'm sad. I'm, I'm medicating with alcohol. That is a very bad message to send because that's one of the worst ways, the worst reasons to take alcohol. The, uh, the, the factor which we know is the biggest determinant of the development of an alcohol use disorder is age of onset. 
the earlier you use, the more likely you'll be to developing addiction. Because if you start drinking alcohol in your teens, alcohol will interfere with all the brain while the brain matures during adolescence. It's a period where all the brain changes. To some extent, the brain during adolescence is as open to alcohol as it is in an adult when you're sad. You know, I'm seeing these uh, Hollywood celebrities, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, George Clooney, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, George Clooney had a billion dollar brand uh, of tequila. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, who I referenced, has a tequila brand. And Ryan Reynolds, a very famous Canadian actor who stars in Marvel movies, uh, has aviation gin. And I'm seeing them promoting alcohol. Now, they're promoting alcohol in a happy way, not as in drink this if you're sad and depressed. So if I'm understanding you correctly, the worst time to drink is when we're sad and the not as bad time to drink is when we're happy. So can I really be critical of these Hollywood celebrities for putting a positive spin on alcohol use? I would say so. Yes, I would say yes. The reason is that if someone has experienced the effects of alcohol when they are happy, but they are used to be drinking alcohol, they are much more likely to resort to using alcohol when they are sad. Because, you know, you may use alcohol regularly, it becomes part of your beer or repertoire. Um, so promoting alcohol does not come alongside a clear educational perspective on why alcohol is dangerous because alcohol is dangerous. Irrespective of why you drink, it's dangerous because you do not know whether you are vulnerable to its effects. And I mean, I hope I did not convey the notion that no one develops alcohol use disorder if they drink a lot in happy places. No, if you drink a lot of alcohol, you are very likely to developing alcohol use disorder anyway. It's just that the quantity is not all that matters. It's the reason why you drink alcohol. So you need alcohol and you need a reason to promote alcohol use disorder, faster or not, but it's never safe to drink a lot of alcohol. So any message that promotes the use of alcohol, and especially suggests that alcohol becomes a social norm in a way to enjoy time. You know, alcohol can be an accessory that one can use perhaps to exemplify a personal experience. It, sh it should never be a necessary component of any expense of a joyful moment in your life. You, you know, life is not necessarily requiring alcohol for you to be happy. Um, and individuals don't need that. So I, I, I think it's still dangerous to promote alcohol, yes. What psychological state are we in when we drink modest amounts of alcohol? And what psychological state are we in when we drink excessive amounts of alcohol? So, um, so there are different levels of modest amount. Uh, early on, there will be a bit of anxiolysis, so we, we feel less anxious. That's the reason why some people would resort to alcohol when they feel bad. Then we are a bit disinhibited. Um, then when we start drinking much more, we become numb. And it may well be the state that individuals with a alcohol use disorder or some substance use disorder are looking for being numb. When my own personal history, my current feelings, my current experiences are difficult to bear. Well, being numb is the solution. And drinking a lot of alcohol is giving me that state. And that is perpetuating then the, the, the states in which these individuals find themselves. Like, I feel bad. I feel stressed. I feel, I feel sometimes guilty. Uh, alcohol becomes the only solution. In that scenario, we're stressed, we're anxious, we drink alcohol. Are we essentially sedating ourselves? To some extent, yes. So, well, self-medication is, in that, that particular case, a form of sedation. So, and there's another aspect that I have not yet touched upon, which is the fact that drugs such as alcohol are also capable of facilitating the development of habits. And um, so they may by pernicuse facilitates the fact that it, it's becoming 
part of my daily life to drink. And I can eventually end up drinking for no reason at all, because that's what I do. And in this particular case, irrespective of my particular internal state, I feel, because that's what I do, I keep doing it. And irrespective of what comes my way, if that's what I do, I keep doing it. So the, the ability of drugs, and alcohol is not the only one, every single drug of abuse that we've tested promotes the formation of habits. Um, that perpet contributes to the perpetuation of the behavior irrespective of what comes your way. And you no longer need any explanation as to why you use it. You use it because you use it. Yeah, and I guess that's built up over generations, isn't it? I mean, if you were a young child and you're watching your mother and father drink alcohol and they're just doing it because they've always done it, then you're likely going to mirror that behavior as you turn into a teenager and later an adult and you're just going to start drinking because that's what your parents did, that's what your friends are doing, that's what you, that's what society is glorifying. That's what you, you just drink. drink because you drink. Absolutely. To some extent, you've just touched upon something that is very important and just very quickly, it may well be one of the reasons why smoking is so addictive. If you ask a child, how do you take cocaine? They can't really tell you. If you ask any child, how do you smoke? They would. How do you drink alcohol? Well, you drink alcohol the way you drink water. It's, it's a behavior that is hardwired, necessary for survival. So there's no real behavioral modality that is restricted to the consumption of alcohol. Right? Smoking is, is very, very different. And the way I understand how memories are preformed, you've just said you see your parents do it, yes. Children, they see the they see the environment do it. They've acquired the habit before, long before they start taking the drug. And it may well be the case that in 10 years from now, because you hardly see anyone smoking on TV, on films, on anything, children may not be able to describe how you smoke. And I would predict that then there will be a decrease in the incidence of drug use, nicotine use, for that matter. Alcohol, it's hardwired. The way we interact with a drug is natural, right? We drink water, we drink alcohol, and, you know, alcohol is just another liquid. So to some extent, what it is, is not specific to us consuming a drug. It is just drinking. So in the way we represent the behavior, well, it's natural. And society must address that. I've been saying publicly for some time now that my prediction is that in two or three decades, 20 to 30 years, we as a society will look upon drinking alcohol with the same level of disdain we currently do smoking cigarettes. From your research, from your experience, from what you've seen, are we witnessing a cultural change now in society's perceptions, acceptance of alcohol? Do you subscribe to my hypotheses that in 20 to 30 years from now, society will have turned its back mostly on alcohol? I, I wish I could share your optimism. Um, I, I do not know. The reason why I do not know is, first of all, the disdain with which we look at smoking is very much an Occidental view. If you go to East Asia, smoking remains very, very prominent. Um, and the consequences of smoking remains very prominent. Uh, alcohol, I guess there's a profound increase. When I say profound, it's because it's profound at the societal level, at the public health level, and at the individual personal level. There's a, a massive increase in alcohol-free drinks, which there are chateaus in Bordeaux that produce very good Bordeaux wine that is alcohol-free, and that is even more expensive than the actual real wine. Um, to some extent, that suggests that perhaps, yes, people are going to learn to interact with the product for the sensory expense, not the psycho, psychotropic effect of, of the substance. Um, 
But let's have a look back at cigarettes. The, the fact that society, in, especially in the UK, there's, there's a profound decrease in, the, in that behavior, smoking cigarettes, but hasn't the use of e-cigarettes made up for it? And I think these are still early days, and I do not know, but could the use of e-cigarettes be more of a gateway for smoking later on in life, especially with flavors and, and access you know, in children to this kind of products? I am, I am still not quite sure what to think about it. Mm. I want to read you from a press article that came out just today in the San Francisco Chronicle, and the headline is California wine is in serious trouble. And it talks about how no single factor is responsible for Californian wine's present predicament. Millennials and Gen Zers aren't drinking as much alcohol as older generations. Hard seltzer and canned cocktails have stolen market share. And the current medical consensus suggests that alcohol is unequivocally bad for human health. And apparently, according to this article, beer and spirit sales are struggling too. What's your view on that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's not something that only affects Californian wine. It's something that you find all across Europe as well. The younger generations seem to be healthier in average than even my generation, I'm 45, and clearly the one before us. Um, I hope that this is... Um, representative of an increased awareness of the consequences of engaging in unhealthy behaviors. And yes, alcohol use is unhealthy. Um, eating, eating junk food is unhealthy. Not doing exercising is unhealthy. Um, and the newer generations have a different approach to life than my generation had. And that also applies to the way the new generations um, approach their their work. The, well, they, they may they may well be less workaholics in the new generations than they were in my generation. So I, I am I think these are very good signs that overall, as a species, we are progressively learning to move away from behaviors that are detrimental to the individual. This notion that people are simply too weak to stop drinking alcohol. I see this all the time on social media. I hear it amongst my friends. They all say, you know how you stop drinking alcohol? You just stop drinking alcohol. And the inference is, is that people who can't stop are just too weak. What's your view on that? So this is what um, affects me emotionally, uh, simply because it is one of the deep roots of the stigma that individuals with substance use disorder and alcohol use disorder um, suffer from. Willpower has nothing to do with substance use disorder. As we've just discussed, drugs interfere with the brain and they produce urges and they produce memories over which we have no control. And they actually even weaken the part of the brain that is responsible for inhibition, the prefrontal cortex. Someone with a substance use disorder is someone who has lost the freedom to stop. It's not that they can't decide to stop. It's not that they have a lack of willpower. They've simply lost the ability to do so. Because drugs facilitate habits, so you keep doing it. Before drug, because drugs produce these aberrant learning mechanisms, which is the drug is the only solution to my problems. The drug is the only thing that actually makes me feel something how can you stop something that is overwhelming? So it is not a problem of willpower. And it is always easy for someone who does not know what it is to not be able to, to not be strong enough, if that is how they think about it, to stop something. It's not a matter of strength. It's a matter of most of the mechanisms in the brain that drugs produce escape awareness and consciousness. So you cannot stop something that you don't see. So it's not a matter of strength. And, and that's the reason why we've changed the way we refer to individuals with these disorders, because they are not 
defined by their condition. They're having a condition. It's a brain condition. Someone once said it's a brain disease, and yes, it is a brain disease, even though we've already discussed the limitations of the word disease. And, uh, and society must change the way we perceive substance use disorder. But as a matter of fact, this stigma is not restricted to substance use disorders. Someone with depression is deemed too weak to cope with stress. As a matter of fact, you know, there are, if there were several people in this room, if I said I'm the heaviest, no one would challenge me. This is what I look like. If I say you are by far the smartest, some people will feel offended. We are not yet willing to accept that there are many more differences in there than those we are willing to accept because we can see them. And these differences, for as long as we haven't understood them, we can't actually show them to the wider society. There will remain stigma around individual vulnerabilities to psychiatric disorders. It's not just about substance use disorders.